I understood that I was saying some very difficult stuff. That was the point of the whole thing. I'm doing this to overthrow the government. And you don't overthrow the government by making the art difficult. You don't overthrow the government by making the text um, weighted with too much dialogue. When I began in the Cold War years, when there was very little dissent, certainly not in mainstream newspapers and, never, and not at all in comic strips, against the government, the establishment, the Pentagon point of view, in that area as well as in others where I was dealing with relationships with men and women, with work and the sense of work, in all of these things I had things I wanted to say that weren't being said generally. I learned how to simplify all of that from Beckett and Waiting for Godot. If you read Waiting for Godot and just read 10 pages of it, it reads like a comic strip. The art and the craft of this film was to take difficult things and make them seem simple so that the reader would not know what he or she was in for. He just dum da dum da dum da dum whack. It's the old magician's sleight of hand. He gets you looking over here while doing this over there. And both as a cartoonist and as a playwright, uh, I love those stunts. Well, my mother was very supportive of me as a cartoonist, which was quite interesting and quite rare because this was during the Depression. Uh, cartoonists were not respectable creatures. And if she didn't, believe me, I wouldn't have been one because she was a tyrant and she, you know, in, a, in a, her benign but heavy-handed fashion. And, and, um, and if she didn't want me to be a cartoonist, I wouldn't have been one. I would have been a dentist or anything she decided. But she came out of Poland, at, as my father did, and they beat the pogrom by 15 minutes. And, and so she always expected another pogrom. And, um, and you were never secure in this country. And the thing you always did as an American was never to take advantage of being an American. My mother didn't believe in free speech on our part because you could get into trouble. And when I went out there, I just did the opposite. I, t I talked back. Going through those high school years, to describe it mildly, the, the, all of those years were feckless and, and fecked up, and I wanted to unfect them. And the only way of doing that, as countless numbers of writers and artists have found out over the years, is to go at this social stupidity that happens to be you yourself, uh, this rather embarrassing person, this poor excuse for a person, and create on paper something that was a lot better, or comment on something, or do something that would take you away from that and turn you into something else. And in that translating process, as, as anybody discovers who went for a nebbage to becoming famous, that in the process, if you happen to get lucky and become famous, you, you work your way out of the, being that schmuck and suddenly you can talk to people anymore and people recognize you and, and admire you. When Jerry Siegel died, the Times asked me to do a eulogy on him. And I wrote that the Superman myth came out of the rise of Hitler in Germany, two Jewish boys living in Cleveland during the rise of American anti-Semitism and the Bund movements and Father Coughlin on the radio. And geeky, nebbishy, uh, bespectacled, pimply guys in high school looking at all these blonde Nazi jocks getting the girls, you know, and, and, and getting the lowest lanes. And here they were wandering around as a bunch of Clark Kents, and the Superman myth was a form of assimilation, merging Clark Kent uh, with Superman as one character, that I'm not really this nerd. You know, if this girl, if this gorgeous girl who won't have anything to do with me, only knew that underneath, if I took my clothes off, I'd have this rippling muscle, this ster steroidal body, which of course they had pipe stamps, you know, but it's the fantasy. And I actually know how to talk to girls. Uh, I'd be witty, which I'm not. I'd be this, which I'm not. I'd have, so it's, it's that pure fantasy, instead of feeling like an alien from outer space. So the outer space that the real superhero came from was, as I wrote, not the planet Krypton, but the planet Minsk. The heft of my work, it came more out of written forms and old time radio and maybe early television comedy. I mean, it came more out of the Jack Benny show, Fib McGee and Molly. These works of the imagination where you couldn't see anything, but was still hysterically funny. Just about all of my work gets written first. They are like improvised comedy. 
that you, you start with an opening line, see where it goes, hope it goes somewhere. On rare occasions, when I come up blank and I have a deadline, I might doodle something on paper, hoping some character would speak to me, some pose, you know, so I'd do somebody in a, a situation of stress, hoping that he or she would start speaking to me, and occasionally it did. It's surprising that I started writing plays at such a late age, I was in my middle 30s, because I realize that um, I've always staged things and think of things as a page when I'm doing a cartoon as a form of theater or film, and that these are actors, these characters I'm putting on paper. Just about all of my work of over 40 years of cartoons are people hardly moving at all. And, and, and when they did move, the, the movement is really a way of telling the reader what is really going on inside their heads. The drawing will often be the subtext behind the text. The text is saying something, but the text is often the unreliable witness. And the only truth you're going to pull out of it is what the character is doing with his or her body. I think it's a danger in any art, and a danger we seem to uh, engage in with great happiness and, love <laughs> and gusto these years, is to make every artist's work autobiography. Uh, and more than that, an extension of his problems, his or her neurosis. What does Walt Kelly being Irish have to do with Pogo? And, and why should we care? What seems to be too much of a pattern these days uh, in terms of scholarship is the determination of the scholars and the critics to capture the essence of creativity and by their, by, by their treating it treating creation like a crime that they have to solve. Uh, they become the creators and they achieve a status on par with whoever they're writing about. So the, the, the scholar who deconstructs F. Scott Fitzgerald and explains to you what Fitzgerald really meant then becomes his peer, no he becomes his superior. And, and, and Fitzgerald didn't have a clue as to what he really was about but this scholar, that scholar, the other scholar, being smarter, better, better educated, and more and a better student of Fitzgerald than Fitzgerald ever was, is clearly more important in the canon than Fitzgerald.